Hey, it's Michelle Malkin, Malkin Live. I'm actually pre-recording this interview and we'll make sure that everybody's able to see it on Tuesday because there's a, some protest brewing in the state of Texas over crony contracts. It all has to do with the data mining racket and one of the most knowledgeable parent public school mom activists uh, who also happens to be a coach for unemployed people is Lynn Davenport. I'm going to bring her in right now. Hey, Lynn. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good. I am so glad to have you because I spotted and have been reading and rereading a devastating piece, uh, just fact filled, uh, tons of links, and actually terrifying on a specific contract that was awarded to a company called MTX to promulgate this uh, very invasive data mining, surveillance, pandemic era contact tracing scheme in the state of Texas. Um, so I wanna sort of set the table and get people up to speed on what's going on in Texas because it's not just about Texas. So who is MTX? MTX is a company, they have two headquarters. One is in Albany, New York, and then they have another in Frisco, Texas. So I got wind of this, uh, this contact tracing agreement that was done through the Texas Department of Health and Human Services and or the, the state health department and uh, Governor Abbott in Texas because it was in a Houston Chronicle article. So I started reading the article and I've been following what's going on with COVID and the contact tracing and digital surveillance and all of that. And so when I started reading about how the deal went down, it mentioned these two lobbyists who were mostly right wing lobbyists in Texas. And it's uh, Dean and Andrea uh, McWilliams. Well, I, I remember the name because I've been doing all this research in K-12 and uh, education and digital online uh, and, you know, digital learning, online learning, uh, surveillance of the kids and, and uh, ed tech. And so I thought, huh, it said they, they paid them $50,000 each. And they're, they're a, power, a power couple from Austin. Uh, so I thought, well, that's that's interesting. So this contract with MTX in Texas and Governor Abbott is a two hundred ninety five million dollar contract. This is uh, they beat out IBM. They beat out Accenture and AT&T services. So I just did a little research and, and started digging uh, in on on what MTX is what they've been doing and found that they have a, they've also given the app, a free app to all public schools in the United States. So there's an, there's this huge intersection of, of contact tracing and K-12 and uh, which is K-12 Inc, not just K through 12. K-12 Inc is a, is a huge online uh, digital learning company. And then uh, you've got Texas, the GOP party and all of these people funding ed tech, and they really want to collapse our tr traditional public schools and get kids on these one-to-one -one devices. And then you've got the vaccines and the the HR 666 yes. involved in this. So it's just a very, very um, interesting intersection of all these things. Yes, it is a crazy bonanza of yeah. money, conflicts of interest, um, control, uh, surveillance, as you say, and from the start of this pandemic, that's been one of my greatest concerns. Uh, you and I met in Texas several months before uh, this whole outbreak um, with other parents, other activists, Alice Linehan, um, who have been concerned coming from the right side of the spectrum about how the public schools are being raided by these big tech companies and our kids are the guinea pigs. And as you always say, and so yeah. many uh, aware parents, woke parents, woke from our point of view, right? <laughs> We're woke uh, about this. When they offer these products for free, 
we are the product, product. Right? right? Right. I right. use that all the time and people really get that. So, you know, in California, when Gavin Newsom was announcing thousands of free Chromebooks and there's Sundar Pinchai, you know, with his big white hat looking like some benevolent charitable yeah. figure. Um, so, yeah, so I, I wasn't able to read the Houston Chronicle article, article mm -hmm. but I saw a Dallas Morning News um, piece that pretty much covered the same thing. So just to clarify, the $295 million, uh, is all federal money, and that comes from the CARES Act. Is that correct? As far as I can tell, it comes from the CARES Act. You right. Know, it's just free money being, it's Christmas everywhere with this CARES Act. <laughs> And all of this money is just being dispensed like Pez candy. Nobody's mm -hmm. tracking it. And um, although this was a four bid contract, uh, some of the things that raised a lot of red flags were the speed with which it was issued. And then also there was no legislative input on it, this. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and what's interesting about the legislative piece is, you know, we have these elected bodies and instead of instead of creating a special session which the governor could do he has created a strike force so he he has a strike force the lieutenant governor has his own task force to get people back to work and and it's interesting that 25 of the 39 people on the governor's strike force are big time donors this is his whole you know his his cabal of billionaire donors. And, you know, you would think that these people, if they are concerned about the economy, wanting to get people back to work, why would they not be speaking out more? I know they're meeting behind the scenes. I get that. And they they think that they're tasked with this, this initiative, you know, to, to get people back to work. And they come from all different uh, backgrounds and industries. And that sounds good, but they're not elected bodies. And they're um, like one of them is a super lobbyist. That was the biggest concern of mine. And I, I wrote about that is a guy who was the chief of staff for the previous governor. He is a, a pharmaceutical lobbyist. He happened to work with the previous governor trying to mandate the HPV vaccination on our girls and parents protested from both sides of the aisle and they said, uh, no, we, you're not going to mandate that. Plus it was all uh, very early in, um, in releasing this vaccine. So people didn't even know what the, the potential consequence or the potential side effects were and the risks. And so that, that was, uh, a big red flag for me when I saw that this guy is now the, the head of the strike force is the super lobbyist. Yeah. Yeah, I know all about that because I reported it at the time uh, about the whole Gardasil mm -hmm. executive order. I reported it at the time when uh, Rick Perry was, um, you know, sort of in the heyday of his presidential campaign, yeah. raised a lot of questions about it because to me it was just so troubling to the core, the way in which he tried to ram it down parents' throats. Mm -hmm. And then the whitewashing of the clear financial conflicts of interest because uh, from what I recall, it wasn't just this one super lobbyist, right? There were multiple staffers uh, in Rick right. Perry's administration that went on to work for Merck, which is the manufacturer of Gardasil. And the, the, the apathy or the lack of concern about the safety of teenage girls, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the clinical trials um, had... I think they were very limited. And of course, safety and e efficacy, most people think that those kinds of clinical trials go on. They don't. They don't. No, they rush these things to the market. And, you know, for the record, I, I put this in, in my article is that don't call me an anti-vaxxer. Don't label me an anti-vaxxer. My kids are vaccinated, but I, our the parent, or I, I will defend parental rights and parents have the right to know which vaccines and to decide which vaccines are right for their kids. And with the Gardasil vaccine, we have a blood relative, a, a niece who had a major reaction. They stopped, you know, they do the boosters on that. Oh, so yeah. you do it you have multiple um, shots for that. And they stopped it because uh, she had a major reaction to it. And so parents need to be able to make those decisions on their own. Texas does have really good parental rights and biometric um, data protections and things that, we, that we're trying to, to preserve. Right, right. 
Um, and that's what it's all about. Whether we're talking about vaccine policy or education policy, it's mm -hmm. protecting parental choice, protecting family sovereignty and protecting student privacy. So um, let's try and, and uh, uh, pivot here and talk about mm -hmm. the, the meat of the article that you have posted on your LinkedIn page. And I'm going to make sure that I tweet that out um, when when these live streams are posted. But there's just so, so much because you go into detail about all of the players uh, that are involved in the educational aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So why don't you walk us through that? Okay. Well, so in, in Texas, uh, and, and this is really going on nationwide. It's a bipartisan effort to collapse traditional public schools, to bring in digital learning, get every kid on a device. And right now with the pandemic, it's this, it, you know, let no crisis go to waste. So there's this, this real rush. And you'll, you see it from Betsy DeVos all the way up to the federal level at the Department of Education to the local legislators and even in our school districts to reinvent and reimagine education now that we've got kids all at home on their devices. Yeah. Um, and if they're not, if they're, if they don't have connectivity, then there's this initiative to get free Wi-Fi and digital hotspots and all of that in the homes, which of course no one has an issue with, with that from an equity standpoint, it's the, the, the agenda behind it, which is every kid tracked and traced and every citizen tracked and traced. So that's, to me, that's where I see this uh, contact tracing and the, the K-12 uh, intersecting is because if you can access the kids from, you know, the you know, pre-K on and track their every move and, and um, then the, the same is going on with the healthcare industry, moving everyone to telemedicine and being able to, uh, and, and then using the virus as the the access point. Oh, well, we've got to know if you've been infected or if you've come in contact with someone, we need to know that. And I had a legislator argue with me yesterday. Uh, he was saying, well, we've already, we've had this for a long time. You know, we've tracked viruses and diseases. Yeah, I agree. I'm not saying you shouldn't study you know, virology and immunology and, and epidemiology. It, the difference is this, this is the first time it's shut down an entire <laughs> the whole yes. world has shut down because of this pandemic. It's the perfect crisis. So all these things that I've been uh, engaged in, you know, and in, in, um, with uh, whether it's data mining or the ed tech stuff, or even the city initiatives that are going on with smart cities, all of it, this is the perfect storm to push us into this fourth industrial revolution and get us all interconnected and on um, constant uh, surveillance and tracking. So yeah, let's talk a little bit more about what exactly MTX does, because uh, at some point they realized they needed to leverage their technology and their business model to exploit the pandemic. And they were doing yeah. sales tracking largely before. And then I guess they got this insight that they were going to pivot to contact tracing. Yeah, yeah. because I, I saw that they were doing, they had contracted with the airports. So when you, people were coming in and out of uh, flights, then uh, they were able to track where they were coming from. And, and, you know, all that's fine and good, but we know that there's more to it. When you look at uh, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, it's being used for more than just what we see. Yeah. And so um, I, I'm sure, you know, he, he, the, the founder of, MTX has great ambitions. I mean, he, uh, there was a tweet where he was talking about global domination. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was fitting. Uh, that, that's, you know, there, these, there are some big egos in these ed tech companies. They know they've got a gift or, a, you know, a, a hot commodity and um, they know, I mean, they want to be the next Steve, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates and, and uh, they, they uh, they're quite ambitious and hey, more power to them. But when when we're talking about these contracts that, you know, this one, I don't know how they got this through so fast. I mean, those are some questions that we have is how are they able to do it? Well, clearly the the 50,000 a piece lobbyists, I'm sure that helped seal yeah. the deal. And um, it's really difficult to get 
open records right now. Public information requests. I've been shut down from my district in Richardson ISD, uh, you know, Dallas, city of Dallas. It's very difficult to get any kind of open records right now. Yeah. Um, there's a, a nexus here in intersection, another intersection. And I talked about this when I uh, came down to speak to Alice's group. Mm -hmm. And when I met you yeah. um, in the figure of somebody like Bill Gates, who of course was behind uh, Common Core, the Gates Foundation also happens to be pushing the vaccine. And of course the expanded surveillance state, whether it's microchips, which we're not supposed to talk about because that makes us conspiracy theorists, it's, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> or the, the digital certificates, every aspect of it. And then of course, all of the ed tech that Microsoft so, you know, here's a, a, a small example, just as a side note, right? Mm -hmm. People start getting paranoid about Zoom. There they are with Microsoft yep. Teams, right? And all our kids are held hostage to this. Uh, and now they're using that and goodness knows what they're they're going to be tracking with that. Um, but the nexus here too is with the globalists, right? Because, um, and I think you mentioned this and we uh, and we corresponded with, about it uh, a little bit beforehand. Um, so MTX is going to set up the, essentially these virtual call centers and a significant portion of its workforce is based in India. And now as a result of this contract, and then I want you to talk about this as well, not just with Texas, but other states, we're looking at the hiring of potentially tens of thousands of virtual call center operators. Yes. And so as far as the con contact tracers go, the governor wants to hire an army of, of those, maybe 4,000 of those. And they, they call them an army. Army. Of, <laughs> army, yeah. And you think of those tracker jackers from Hunger Games. <laughs> yeah. <you> know, <laughs> buzzing at your door. But, uh, but the, that's the, the interesting thing is the 25,000 virtual call center uh, people that will be hired for this, you know, on the, on the or behind the scenes for this contract. So, you know, and somebody was, was, um, or they kind of uh, enlightened me on what that really looks like. And they think it's more along the lines of blockchain. So when I was talking about the artificial intelligence and the, uh, the telemedicine and it, it's, um, it's very, it's wonky and, and, complicated and I don't want to get into blockchain because I'll butcher it. But that is, that's the end game is, is digital identities. Everybody on, uh, it'll start out as, uh, you know, your, your cell phone and a QR code, but it'll eventually be some sort of quantum tattoo or a, a biometric identity. And it'll be, you know, they can do it where they embed it in your, your skin. I mean, that's, it's not crazy to think that this uh, might happen because it is happening. So none of this is conspiracy. And um, I ripped off Gore Vidal's uh, quote about, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm a conspiracy analyst. Uh -huh. Because I mean, these things are, they're in, they're hiding in plain sight. I, I mean, I can document everything with, they, they put it out there. They don't hide they're crazy. They're proud of it. And they, they have it all out there for people to see. You just have to have the, the, you know, the, uh, you know, if you're like me and you, you want to know more, then you start doing the research. And I just, I read things and they tell us exactly what their plans are and they don't hide it. So it's not, it's not a conspiracy theory. Yeah. I mean, and they are very brazen about it, as you say. So however many untold billions are, are available through cares, HR six, 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 I mean, they had to add another devil in there. Right. <laughs> Which, um, the which extra six. You know, it right. wasn't until I read your article that I realized what that acronym meant testing, reaching, mm -hmm. and contacting everyone act. Trace. Um, yeah. Trace, that's right. So cute, so cute you how know, they come up with these they things. They do this yeah. all the time, too, with the, uh, yeah, ESSA and the, like, uh, they're just so great right. at it. Um, so this is an extra hundred billion dollars, right? So you've got these two massive bottomless pots that are going on. And let's see, so you're enlisting public health agencies, state health departments, um, public school districts, which are going to be mined to death, uh, universities, right? Right. Public universities and colleges. Um, we mentioned airports already. Mm -hmm. Um, what, what, yeah, I mean, I guess I mean, my, my I have two two questions. Take either one or both. 
um, in whatever order you want. But given how difficult it is to get um, information through FOIA or Public Records Act, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's not business as usual in terms of grassroots activists being able to hold these people accountable, go to meetings, stop it. I mean, uh, you know, I put the thing here on the uh, on the banner that there's going to be a rally to protest it. But mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, it seems like the, the, the gears are already working. How, how do we throw a wrench into the gears? Yeah, that's, and speaking of wrench in the gears, that a, a good friend of mine is Allison McDowell, and she's done a ton of research. I mean, I highly recommend if you want to understand what's going on at the, it's a global agenda and this this whole global education reform movement as well as the the global impact investing network and um, the telemedicine blockchain and cryptocurrency and how um, all of these systems are being completely remade and reinvented and and they're all going to eventually connect um, it's fascinating so uh, there we are doing a rally to uh, yes tomorrow at uh, five o'clock in uh, Frisco, which is where the head, the second headquarters for MTX is. And um, what's what I think is good about this uh, protest is that it's bipartisan. And the the criticism that was in the Houston Chronicle was bipartisan. There was a legislator, uh, a Democrat, uh, Donna Howard, who was questioning how this went down, and um, and then uh, they had Senator uh, Paul Bettencourt. Yeah, Betancourt, and then they had um, Angela Paxton. So uh, that, and Angela's husband is our uh, attorney general, which, uh, you know, and, and just because they're conservative does not mean that they're always on the right side of things because her husband also brought in a lot of digital, Senate Bill 1557, which opened the door for a lot of this digital learning, which uh, most of these people who push these bad bills, they do not, they would not allow the same thing for their own children. But that. <laughs> Such you a know, good point. Right. Such a good um, point. There's all, you know, and I want to mention that Texas has one tenth of America's children. So when you think about how important it is for them to take Texas, whether it's through school choice vouchers and um, education savings account and all, accounts and all these these agendas that are coming um, from the federal level on down, uh, Texas is a target because if they can get all these rural communities and get them all uh, you, you've got the education superhighway funded by Gates and Zuckerberg. That's the, the the connectivity to all the rural areas. So that's the thing that's stopping them from completely uh, taking over the system right. is just the connection. So they've got to get. Oh, and, and Gates, I want to mention this, too. Gates invested in Crown Castle, which is a 5G company, uh, and they, they do cell towers. Um, and. So part of 5G is putting in smaller, uh, more frequent cell towers everywhere. And he invested $650 million in Crown Castle last year. Crown Castle is the company that my district and Dallas ISD have contracted with uh, to the tune of you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the kids Wi-Fi hotspots. So, you know, you could draw the, I mean, is he Nostradamus or did he know that we'd all be sheltering at home needing to to be on our our devices and have that connection uh i don't know i mean that you can be the judge of that but he yeah yeah i'll just leave it at that yeah you know you put the dots out there and let people connect them or avert their gazes right. you know <laughs> um, right. y'all draw your own conclusion uh just to so people understand this um and to spell it out MTX is supporting contact tracing call centers in New York, where you said they're they were originally based in Albany, right? Mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Georgia, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Illinois. And I'm just I think it's safe to assume that those contracts, of course, are going to reach into the crevices of the of the public school systems. And right. So right. if they offer that app free, then that really that, you know, like you said, when it's free, you are the product. So that is an access point. And that's very important because the 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 early bird gets the worm. Whoever gets that access first, they can then have the baseline data. And a lot of of, um, of these um, 
uh, schemes, it's important for them to have that baseline data, whether they need to show growth or improvement. This happens in ed tech a lot. So you'll have a math software program. And if the investors put the money up front, then they want to see the growth and then they get the return on the end. Right. once it's done. And it and the requires massive amounts of data. And we know that education is the most data mineable industry to date. And Texas has mined more student data than any other state. Right. So there are other aspects of this too, which we haven't um, spelled out. There's so many. Um, and one is the, the public safety aspect of who is getting access to the data. I mean, that's a whole nother animal it's like a hydra, right, with all these heads, um, and how and, and whether uh, third parties are, are going to, to be able to buy that data. And then there's a national security component of it as well, because if you have a company like um, MTX, which uh, from what I recall, its app is used by Salesforce. Salesforce is one of the top H1B exploiters um, in the country on the planet. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, of course, you've got H1Bs and outsourced workers, IT workers, and you're familiar with the uh, IT industry, mm -hmm. um, largely from China and India, who are now working from home in their home countries remotely doing God knows what with health and you know mental health and, and private medical data, data of Americans. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, one one thing that um, I'll point out, too, is that big oil seems to be deeply embedded in this agenda because data is the new oil. And so you'll find that these ed tech companies are funded by some of these big Texas oil guys. And and we even have there was a, a reasoning mind, you know, Sherry Kiesiker, Kiesiker. Oh, yeah. I said she uh, did a, a big expose on reasoning mind and how it was funded by Texas and Moscow oil. So Alice and I went to the Senate and we testified on it. And the there's a congressman, uh, Van Taylor, and he was a senator at the time, but he pushed a bill through that is a social impact investing bill for math software. So investors can turn a profit on kids' math scores in Texas. Yes. Oh my gosh. And do you think he would endorse that for his precious kids who go to an elite private school in Dallas? Do you think that that would be okay if math, uh, people could make money on his kids' math scores? No. Wow. No. Wow. Yeah. And so these are the same people who are also so big on school choice. And, you know, you've got Ted Cruz, who's like, uh, you know, they talk about parent empowerment and um, how this is, you know, the civil rights issue of our time is, it, you know, and how they care about those poor kids trapped in failing schools. And it's, it's all an agenda to collapse the traditional public schools to get kids on devices. And they say in the name of efficiency, because, you know, we like to, we conservatives want to save our money and we don't want to waste money on those government schools. And so they'll talk about how it's more efficient to get these kids on these one-to-one -one devices. Well, yeah, might be more efficient. You don't have to pay a human teacher, but what are the unintended consequences of kids on devices all day stuck on their screens? And, you know, what are we doing? How is that okay? Well, we're creating an entire new generation mm -hmm. of pathologies for right. one thing. Right. I mean, so many parents have realized that more screen time means more um, unhealthy, corrupted, depressed, anxious kids. And that was before the pandemic, right? No, <laughs> um, I know. Kids, no one wants to talk about nobody what it does. looks like. I mean, I've got, you know, I've, uh, so I'm a career coach for job seekers and we do a Zoom call and it's, you, you see the faces of, you know, 50 people on the screen and all telling their stories. And this is the first time, first time in 10 years, I don't know where to tell them, where, where do I tell them to go? I mean, there are only so many essential jobs that are hiring right now. And uh, yeah, and that's our adults. So imagine what our kids are feeling and thinking and and what are we going to do with them this summer? Yeah. Yeah. My my kid uh, had hoped to be uh, in a fine arts program for the summer that he's on hold for that. And. Um, you know, the only administration official that I have heard speak in a sensitive manner about the impact of all of this on kids was Melania Trump last week. She addressed children. Yeah. And she talked about, uh, you know, kids missing prom and, and sports events and all that. But it was a two minute address. 
right? Not enough. <laughs> no, I've got, a, I've got a 20, my middle child graduated this month and yeah, everything it, it's, yeah, it's terrible. It's tragic. And, and yet you have other administration officials who are, you know, essentially doing the tango with these big tech ed tech companies. You mentioned uh, Betsy DeVos uh, briefly and, you know, oh, which she, was a, she and her husband have been investors in K-12 Inc. And that's an important uh, distinction there. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more that uh, more about K-12 Inc.? Yeah. So uh, if you look at who started it, you've got the king of the or the junk bond king, Michael Milken. And then you've got Ron Packard, who was of uh, Goldman Sachs in the 80s, M&A guy. And so they so when Milken got out of the federal penitentiary, he invested, I think it was 10, 10 million in K-12. And so he and Packard started this. And the, the thing that I think people don't understand is that charter schools and online, this K-12 Inc., they are funded by our tax dollars, just like our public schools are. So people want to, want to talk about efficiency. Well, we're basically funding a parallel, a dual system of education. And um, I don't think they understand that. So it's, you know, to me, it's like, you know, if you're, you're married and you can barely afford to be, well, you know, you don't have any money while you're married, then you get divorced. Well, now you have two homes to pay for and you don't have any new income coming in. Well, that's the same thing with this split to fund charter schools and, and uh, K-12, but they've spent millions of dollars on advertising. Well, our public schools can't do that. They can't spend money on advertising and lobbyists and, and uh, you know, they, they advertise on Nickelodeon and, you know, some of those channels and they can access uh, parents in a different way than our public schools can. So I've been trying to open people's eyes who are in the mainstream of the Republican party about this. And mm -hmm. um, again, I've talked about it with, with you all. And, and it's, it's a little frustrating, right? Because okay, they, they, yes, right? They've, they've been conditioned to, you know, they'll say, well, we need, you know, we got to get rid of those government schools. They're breeding a bunch of little socialists. But my argument is people don't show up to their school board meetings. Those are the people who set our taxes and they set the tax rate and our property taxes fund the schools directly. People don't show up to these and they don't, they don't vote in these races. And then they complain about these, you know, people taking over their schools. They also say, you know, they got to put God back in the schools. I'm like, well, we need to put God back in the legislature and back in our churches and back in our homes. Like draw the circle around you, buddy. You know? <laughs> and I went to public schools and I don't remember, I, I don't remember a whole lot of, of um, faith-based things, you know, in the seventies when I was growing up And there. I, I don't, I don't necessarily, um, agree with that idea because the way, I mean, really, I want my kids to go to school to learn how to read and do math and know history. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we should be able to pray, uh, but the way that they've set it up, it's only some people can pray in our schools. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this, I'll just interject a little bit of, of political analysis here because I'm very familiar with the school choice movement. I used to give speeches. I gave speeches to the Milton Friedman Foundation. Rah, rah. I'd wear that yeah. yellow scarf like I talked about, you know. And there's like thousands of these scarves lying around at the Salvation Army. I found, I found right? two at the thrift store, took a picture of them. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, somebody, awesome. somebody is spending some bodies are spending a lot of money to promote this for, uh, in part for virtue signaling reasons. Um, sure. And you know, look like they care right? about kids and, in their cities. And, and, right. And the bottom line is there is a lot of cynical, um, political part partisan tokenism involved here. And I think that I mean I've met enough sincere people who you know are true believers in all of that, thinking, oh well, if we invest here, then there'll be some political payoff. But I mean, if you look at the partisan split um, by race, it really hasn't budged much over the last 30, 40 years. So like, what mm -hmm. is the return on the investment if that's what you're involved, if, if that's what your involvement is, is inspired by? So that's one thing. But then mm -hmm. the other thing, too, that I think is really insidious, Lynn, is that by promoting this, and it's mostly a lot of these libertarian, big tech funded um, think tanks, 
And uh, I can't remember if we've talked about the Texas Public Policy Foundation, but I mean, oh, yeah. right? I've, I put them in the article too, because yes. yeah, I'm, I might agree with them on a lot of things, but most of those bad bills come from there. Yeah, that's right. And they had, they had Jeb Bush on there the other day talking about, of course, you know, what we can do during COVID and, and uh, maximize this distance learning, which is a total oxymoron. Jeb Bush. I mean, you know, there are a lot of gripes that I have about President Trump, but one of his biggest triumphs was denying Jeb Bush the White House. Uh, you know. Well, yeah, and so okay, so so people, we elect Donald Trump over Jeb Bush, and we might as well have had Jeb because he puts Betsy DeVos in there as the yeah. education secretary, who spent you know thirty years trying to undermine public education. And how are her kids educated in that big old beautiful house of hers? That's a really good question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's my frustration because okay, maybe Trump uh, denied Bush. The, the actual title of president, but he's running education policy, Jeb is. Many Jeb acolytes are now embedded in the White House running immigration policy, uh, importing millions of you know lower wage workers who are supplanting STEM, American STEM graduates, STEM, STEM. STEM. You know, the, 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 the great holy grail of STEM. Um, and yeah, so then we come back to this question about what are we supposed to do about it? Yeah, uh, what what do we do to stop this? Um, yeah. I, you know, people are talking about getting a flip phone and all <laughs> all these things. <laughs> and I'm like I I don't know if that's even gonna. I don't think that. I I don't know. I mean, we're not at the point where we have Chinese social credit and Sesame scoring, but we're getting we're there. Close. And so, if we can, I mean, to me, that is that's the. It's over if we're at that point. And yeah. so, how do we stop? that um you know we know that they're rolling out the 5g network which will eventually turn into the the 6g and and beyond um you know one thing that mtx i'm i'm trying to figure out if mtx is involved in any kind of um uh it's it's um neural networks. I don't know if you've studied oh, anything sure. with the neural networks. I don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know how much, how deep they are into this stuff and who's funding them. I, I don't know. That's, that's something that uh, if we had more investigative journalists, we might be able to find that out. Yeah. Uh, and then of course I, I do think it all ties into blockchain, but um, there's a, a blockchain sub department in the department of education. So okay. they know all this is coming. And uh, so I don't understand yeah, I don't know how to stop it. I just know it's got to be grassroots. We have to have people who are challenging and questioning these contracts and 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 the public-private partnerships, which skirt transparency. That's happening everywhere. That seems to be how a lot of this uh, gets in. And and the bad bills, seven thousand bills in the Texas legislature. Over half were education bills. If that doesn't tell you our children are a target, and yeah, and big time. Yeah, no, yeah. It does. By the way, I noticed one detail. It was in the Dallas Morning News article. I don't know if it was in the Houston Chronicle about the MTX contract in Texas, which is that as part of the proposal, apparently. And by the way, you haven't seen the proposal, right? I haven't seen the proposal. The newspaper got a hold of it. And apparently some of the senators did, but they are they're under some sort of confidentiality. Well, because they say it's proprietary. That's how they always get around this stuff. Yeah. It's just like real estate deals. Oh, well, it's, you know, it'll ruin the deal if they reveal. Right. And then so you never get to see. But there were a bunch of things that were redacted. The Those those writers did a good job of, uh, of digging. Digging the dirt. Um, so one yeah. thing they said real quick before I forget uh, mm -hmm. and was that they had proposed uh, some sort of partnership with Google and Apple for the proximity tracing app. And I don't know yeah. how that those two things would work together, but you know, more red flags. Right. If you're, right. you're pinging next, yeah. That's right. right. Um, and I mean, you could just imagine, cause like, you know, Sherry and, and um, Brooke Henderson and some of the other moms have talked about the geolocation tracking. That's what the subject of the New Mexico suit is. And um, there's a, mm -hmm. another family either in California or Illinois talking about this. But just that all that geocaching that's already happening. So yes. right. Yeah. And we, you know, we 
we want those things because people love to track their children or they love, I mean, we want all these great tools, but we want the protections and we want to be able to opt in to things rather than having to opt out of it. And that's the piece that, you know, I, I men seem to be the worst about saying, oh, all this stuff is already here. And what are you afraid of? And, uh, you know, this, um, you know, they're, they play the devil's advocate on it, but I think that um, we've got to have the friction in that um, opposition or yes. else they'll just push anything through. And, and I think a lot of people don't see, like I'm always looking at the end game. Where are they going with this? Yeah. I can see the players and the patterns and, and I know something's not right. My instincts tell me uh, something's not right. And I know what to kind of research, but I'm always looking, what's the end game? Where are they? And, and Allison and, and McDowell and wrenching the gears will tell you exactly where they're going. Cause she has all the blueprints and documentation. It's, it's scary stuff. And we're talking transhumanism. I mean, wicked, uh, you know, human. Um, and yeah, I'm not even going to go into all that. It's, it's sci-fi creepy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like what you said about, um, cause there are, and I'm not one to play the, the sexism or gender card um, no. too often. However, there is a condescension among a lot of these big tech CEOs. And you mentioned that Texas oil is, uh, you know, gotten its uh, tentacles yeah. into this as well. And I noticed this among a certain subset of these Republican bigwigs that they've been dismissive of, oh, those hysterical moms. This yeah. actually happened during the Obama administration. And when it's, um, you know, if, if they have D's by their name, then, you know, everybody on Fox News got all worked up about it. Arne Duncan, right? There was a very infamous quote where he talked about, I, I think he even, he even accused white suburban moms of being racist for opposing Common Core. Right. Oh yeah. Well, right? I, I get all that. Of, right. So all right. of a sudden, you all of a sudden you can you can uh, point that out. But if it's a Republican Texas billionaire, you're supposed to shut up and just be right. quiet because right. you don't know what you're talking about. No, there's a guy in Texas. He, yeah, I'll send you the clip because it's so condescending. <laughs> but he's like, Texas uh, soccer moms were so uh, so mad because little Johnny wasn't going to get into UT. It was the moms who were fighting the star testing the standardized oh, yeah. testing. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is this is what makes this battle very interesting because um there are uh there are civil liberties folks on the left who've been raising big red flags about this. And I know yes. that the American Civil Liberties Union, for example, I think they've got litigation over the contact tracing stuff in, in some of the other states yeah. the back east, right? And uh, every aspect of it, the educational aspect of it, the public health aspect of it. So there's this interesting coalition. And the other thing that makes this difficult uh, as a battle to fight is Silicon Valley, which of course has huge vested interest in this, mm -hmm. you know, talk about this until we're blue in the face, mm -hmm. is controlling the discourse online. And so there's this false narrative, for example, over the lockdown protests. Oh, it's all those scary right wingers carrying guns that are fomenting this when there are people right. left, right and center that all oppose it. Right. No, that that's a very good point. Um, you know, it's it. Look, the people they use identity politics and all those things to drive a wedge. Because if we all get together and do this at the grassroots level, there's power in that. We could actually stop it. Um, I've separated from party line, and and you know, um, I show up everywhere. I go to Democrat meetings. I go to Republican meetings, Tea Party. I go everywhere and and just try and make connections with people who care about the things that I care about, which I think are things everyone cares about. When I ran for school board, it's a nonpartisan race. I lost. Uh, but uh, people try to make it about partisan politics. I'm like, this is everyone should care about how our kids are educated and if our money is going to all these special interests. And, uh, you know, that's that's that should be nonpartisan. Why? Why are you making this about party? Didn't help that there was a picture of me with <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> <out there. laughs> the, like, but nobody pulled up the picture of me with Democrats. They only got <laughs> yeah. me with Trump. Well, you know, I think it shows that uh, that there's a lot of harm in all sorts of quarantines. And when mm -hmm. people quarantine themselves, uh, you know, ideologically or partisan-wise, um, that cool. serves 
certain interests, right? Well, you mentioned the ACLU. So I read this article about South Korea and uh, it, it was talking about uh, some guy went to a club and infected all these people with COVID supposedly and the contact tracing, they outed him. They outed where he worked. It was an LGBT guy. And so that's a perfect example of the dangers of this getting out there. I mean, people can, you'll, you'll be publicly lynched if you, if they know where you were, they, people can figure out the deductive reasoning. They know yeah. how to find you. It's oh, not yeah. that hard. Yeah. So that's an example. I mean, people on the left and the right should be completely opposed to this kind of tracking, sorting, tracing, and surveillance on our citizens. I totally agree. And that's a great note to end on. I just want to sure. urge people to go to your Facebook at Educray, <laughs> which I love. I want that on a bumper sticker. Uh, I wanted it on my my uh, license plate, but my husband was like, uh, no, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Would you be able to get through? <laughs> Texas, what? State DMV? <laughs> yeah, you can do a personalized one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then also you're a member of Parent Coalition for Student Privacy. Yes. Uh, so I uh, urge people to go to studentprivacymatters.org. And then uh, this rally is taking place Tuesday, yes. May 26, 5 p.m. at the Frisco MTX office, office of MTX. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely turn up if you're close, if you're anywhere near Frisco, drive if you have to. And Lynn will be there. And Lynn, I'm also going to be um, linking your amazing LinkedIn piece, okay. linking LinkedIn piece um, when we tweet this out. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Michelle, for all you do. I really appreciate it. You bet. Keep fighting. All right. All right. You too. Bye.